Okay, I think that's about 10 o'clock. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, yeah, this is just going to be like a really informal uh, chat about data. Because this is, I don't know, I, I sort of talked about this before online and people were like, yeah, I, I have hit this problem myself. I'm never quite sure like what format to use, like well, there's benefits and drawbacks for each one. It's something that I've like kind of been banging my head against for a while as well. Um, and I'm not expecting there to be like, oh, okay, we've all talked about it and this is the perfect solution and everyone uses this. Like, it's not really about that. It's just like kind of about thinking about if there's any, um, yeah, any like, oh, I didn't think about that, that, that solution, that like, you know, way of getting around that drawback or, oh, I didn't know there was this other alternative method. So like, yeah, maybe from this we'll find some ways of, of like, I don't know, solving the problems we've been hitting or coming up with some other solutions and yeah. I'm just kind of looking forward to talking about that. Uh, so I really, I prepared this very, very informal, like, what do you call it? Agenda? It's just something to like talk about and look at at the same time. So I'm just going to be like sitting in here the whole time. <laughs> so feel free to like add comments and we'll just kind of like go down the the, the list. Um, and yeah, people feel free to like chime in uh, or write stuff in. I guess we can use the UI chat text channel i guess i'll try and monitor that one um yeah i'll write comments in the the actual document itself um i'm gonna record this and put it online so let me know if uh yeah yeah just for fyi if you if you talk about comments that will end up probably on youtube so um yeah thanks everybody for joining uh so i guess yeah some of the stuff i wanted to kind of keep in mind these are probably there's probably other things people can talk think about as well when we talk about each approach um, but I come at it from like a, we're trying to make stuff for the designers generally. Um, so like there's, there'll be data that you might use as like really low level, uh, I don't know, stuff that the designers never really have to touch. I wouldn't really think about that as much. It's more things like, I don't know, you have an RPG and you have 10,000 items. Like that's kind of like the classic thing. Um, or you have, uh, I don't know, a bunch of different factions in an RPG and some different units, and you want them to be able to like define the attributes of those things. Um, so it's kind of like going towards that data-driven gameplay thing. So we're thinking about like how is it for the designers to like actually edit the data? Um, what do they prefer working in? Can they do all the things they need to do? Uh, cooking is stuff like, you know, if you have, uh, maybe as part of that editing, you would let them choose okay we're making a new weapon what does the model look like maybe the designer doesn't choose that but they use like a temporary uh what do you call it they use a temporary like model to start with and then later on that would be swapped out so some of these things are uh if that's only referenced from like a csv file that might not get cooked because the game doesn't know it's referenced uh, the single point of authority is something that i've hit a couple of times myself it's like the idea that if you want to define your data in a single place where it should be one place, like the classic example I've had is like, okay, we had a CSV file locally and we had a Google Sheets doc, like Google Sheets thing. Um, and if people make an edit in one and not duplicate it in the other, but people will like overwrite each other's stuff um, and you'll end up with data being lost. Uh, scalability is like, okay, well, maybe a system works well for like 10 items, but like when you have 100,000 items or 10,000 items, does it maybe not work as well? That doesn't mean you should never use it. It's just like, well, okay, in our, in our game, we're only going to need 20 items. So this approach is totally fine. Or, oh, in this, or maybe for a totally, with, even within the same game, um, you might have like, okay, one type of data needs 10,000 items, but there's only going to be three classes, three character classes. So maybe you'd use different data formats for like each of those if you want. Um, this is something someone else brought up as well. It's like, how do you deal with actually like different versions of the game uh, having different data? Um, so like if you've, you know, you've got a new beta version coming out, if everything is in the same like data tables online, sorry, the same like Google sheet online, like how do you differentiate between like, uh, oh, we, we're doing version two, but we also need to do a, a patch for version 1.1. So we need to make sure that like, if we're getting data we don't accidentally put the 2.0 data in a 1.1 release. So like separating those, um, some of those, I mean, like, yeah, some of the, some, some data formats will be better suited to that than others, but it's just like another thing to consider. Uh, 
it's, I hope this isn't like overwhelming, but it's just like things like to think about as we talk about each one. Maybe people can bring up examples where they're like, oh yeah, I've used this and there is actually a way of, you know, addressing this consideration. Um, somewhat related to that is the modern DLC compatibility issue. So it's like, okay, if, if we're going to let players have mods or maybe we're going to release DLC, which is kind of a mod sometimes, uh, how can we let the users add data? Like if 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 it's like some very cryptic format, maybe they wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and if they're adding it into like a separate directory, can we like discover that naturally in the, in through the game? Like, can we find those extra items that they've added uh, when we're like looking for stuff to spawn? Um, validation as well is something that I'm like big on. Um, so sometimes like well, this is like a use case we've had. Like, imagine you've got a, a Google Sheet and the editing, I don't know. Uh, output damage um and the the number you want is like between one and a hundred but they do it between zero and one because like maybe they think it's a percentage thing and that's the standard they want um they think it is you would ideally you'd validate that like right at the source so like as soon as they type in 0 0.3 you would show an error um and you could do that if it was just like them editing like a uh like a, a blueprint you could like have nice data editing, but like data, data validation. But like if you if you're coming from a Google Sheet, if you do that in like kind of like a naive way, you'd have to like run the full import and then maybe even run the game and then maybe show them a warning like oh it seems like the the damage output is like less than one, or it's like a float rather than an integer, or maybe the, <laughs> it gets downloaded as a float and then gets rounded to an integer, so you end up with like zero. So yeah, ideally they would, the the designs would get told like earlier. And then uh, I'm, there's still more stuff here, but this is I threw it in the end. Is like, what if you have ten thousand items? Maybe you've like set them to load all of their related assets like in a in a safe way, so they're not like loading every single texture and ob an object referenced, but like loading those ten thousand items. Do we need to keep those all in memory all the time? Is there a way of like separating those nicely? This is something I haven't dealt with myself, but it just seemed like something when we we're talking about a hundred thousand items, ten thousand items. Like maybe it's something we can think about. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel, for like adding the the versioning between there. I don't know if there's any other considerations people like have they want to shout out, bring up. We can always like mention them as we go through the different data formats. Um, if there's something where you're like, oh, actually, this sucks for this reason. <laughs> okay, so let's start talking about the data formats then. Um, the simplest one is just like vanilla blueprints so by that i just mean like you you have a uh, you object and you subclass it uh, and then you make a, a blueprint of that so you have a bunch of blueprint assets um so like it's great for small numbers of, of items you can uh do validation fairly easily with like some of the ui min max like clamping um it does the only way you can sort of do the batch stuff that i know of is bulk edit via property matrix so uh i don't have one running right now but like yeah you write you select a bunch of assets and then you can right click and get like a nice table view it doesn't work with everything as far as i know like imagine you have an array of let's say let's say you've got like a bunch of blueprints one for each weapon and each weapon has like a different attack like i don't know grenade or like multi fire or laser versus ranged or something um i don't think you can like i don't think it's easy to do like arrays of arrays in that way um i think i don't know if anybody knows if there's a way of doing this like so this is something that designers have asked me before they've they've done it i've seen them do it in in google sheets and excel it's like okay say you've got uh, i don't know a uh, bunch of items or weapons or ships or something. So you want to like, you've got a bunch of different types of ships and you're like, oh, everything dies too quick. I wish everything was like about 25% stronger. Like, I guess you could make every weapon like 25% weaker, but what if I just want to like, increase the HP by 15%? You could do that in Google, in Sheets with like making a you know new formula and making a new column and overwriting the stuff by messing things around. But as far as I know, I know you like on individual U property windows, you can like type the value, like multiply by something and it'll evaluate the math but i don't know if you can do that like across all items yeah the, the only way you could was maybe really... that's a niche thing but i don't know i see i see designers wanting to do box stuff um they can hear uh, me and then 
also for like discovery this might come up later on but like i've always wondered about this like imagine we, you've we got can, we can hear um, daniel but i don't know if uh, yeah like a bunch of items in your game and they get Daniel's dropped by enemies yet. and you create a new type of item if you want it to be picked up and found by something else by like i don't know your spawner um you would have to have like a library blueprint and then add that new thing you made and link it in um I don't know if anybody knows of like ways of programmatically discovering stuff. Um, I heard some voices oh, wait, in the background. Did someone want to comment on the wait, previous I can't hear comment? You? Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I have some comments. I don't know if Ben can hear us. <laughs> someone talking? Yeah, we're all talking. Um, yeah, we're all talking right now. now. I can't hear you. Shoot, what have I done? I think he's muted all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what have I done? The funniest round table. Okay. Yeah. Oh my goodness, my it muted. <sighs> How did I mute it? I was just right. being like the most rude host ever. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, so okay. we can hear us back. Now. I'm so sorry. Okay. Hi. All right. Yeah. So the only <laughs> way you know you to do the Excel style math is you know you build tooling on top of top of the bulk edit. So okay, you like editor utility widgets, editor utility blueprints, or just any other tool print where you're doing mass editing of the default object mm -hmm. uh, for blueprints, which I've never done that. I've always done the more yeah, central datalized approach, but that's the only way I'm aware of. And one another big consideration. That's a lot of blueprints that we'd have yeah. to save and check in. That's true. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you would, yeah, you would need to like, even it wouldn't, it's a very large number, maybe even do commandlets and reference checks, make sure you're not reading like any, crazy renaming our moves that would require updating yeah. redirectors mm -hmm. um and the only other big concern i think with vanilla blueprints is something i've been thinking a lot more now that has caused issues in other games i'm aware of is you know even when you have data only blueprints each of those blueprints is a new u asset that has to be cooked and it has memory Mm -hmm. So that adds to your packaging time, your cooking time, your duration time, your loading time. Versus if, like, it's some designers do like that having that single, single easy place to find to edit holistic data. Mm -hmm. But if that data is defined in a struct, whether in you know data table, data asset, etc., it doesn't have that those same costs uh, that a, that a full blueprint would. A blueprint also adds the risk of someone adding a type that creates an additional dependency that might create dependency hell. It's kind of like the pro and the con of having blueprints. Like you give them the power, yeah. Is that too much power? Mm -hmm. Wait, well, yeah, I think. Can you talk yeah, a bit about what, what you mean by dependency hell in that case? Like, just yeah, like for example, like let's say you have a data only blueprint base, and you're allowing people, like the developers, to use it to add variables and stuff. And because it's a blueprint, you also give them the power to be able to extend the blueprint and add whatever variables they want to like to that. Mm -hmm. Then they can start adding variables that are of the types of other blueprint objects. And those other blueprints can have their own um, reference hell where they have hard references to assets like meshes, which I don't get streamed in, that just gets immediately added to the memory as soon as you load it. It, it even... Uh, actually gets uploaded directly to the render hardware interface thread. So it's like getting uploaded to the GP, which is taking out some of your frame time also as you're loading it. I just recently found this out, which is hilarious. Okay. okay. That's good to know. Like, yeah, I know about like the, yeah, making sure you've got, you're using soft asset references for things that you're not like actively loading them. But yeah, I guess if people can just subclass it, they can yeah. just accidentally add those. And Okay. It's, it's so easy to make people not create those if they just have some other thing like, uh, you know, Excel or common separated values file, because mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to make hard references through those. I think there's some subtlety, too, that's complicated with blueprints that we've struggled with in the past around um, referencing blueprint types is really easy to do. Like you mentioned, like, if you declare a variable and they when they set the type for the variable, they choose another blueprint class. You create a hard reference to that class independently of any um, of any use of it, and it's similar in the blueprint when you're just invoking functions. Like to be able to call a blueprint function from another blueprint, you are implicitly creating a hard reference to it, um, and so it's it's very it can be very non-obvious. Like when you add those, yeah, I think Actually, I can add some. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. 
Uh, okay, just a tiny little thing. Yeah. I want to tell you about something that I guess it, it's probably a bug. I, I found this in 4.27. It might already be in 5. I haven't checked it. Is that if you make a soft uh, point of reference of some type, the type will be a hard. Oh, yeah, reference. that's great. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. Yeah. Okay, so the type itself, to you have to load the type to know that it's the yeah, so for that type. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so for example, when we have character classes, um, we, you know, we usually set it to the base character class, the engine class, as a soft reference type. Uh, if we set it to any of our own blueprints, then it actually creates a hard reference to it. Uh, but yeah. just to add on, like on the hard references, uh, we had a similar issue with that, uh, where our kind of blueprints were referencing, hard referencing, like gameplay um, and uh, assets. And then we wanted to create this like Wikipedia on the main menu, where uh, players can go through every unit and just saw, see their stats. Uh, but since it was hard referencing, like we ended up loading the whole game day, like gameplay assets in the main menu because they were like hard referencing. Uh, so we had experience with this definitely. Yeah, I can see that. And the thing is, like, I wouldn't expect designers to have to care or know about this stuff, right? Like, they, they're making the game and balancing it and doing all that stuff. Like, that's, I mean, there's different types of designer, right? There's technical ones and, like, more, like, non-technical ones. But, like, yeah, like, having to care about all this, like, is it loading or not? Like, that seems like more of a designer thing. So that's good to know, like, thinking about, like, oh, if it's just in CSV, they can't, like, you know, accidentally do that stuff. Um, well, that's something we can talk about later when we get to CSV. Is like I, I, it is kind of nice that they're allowed to that they can add new variables and stuff, and they can have a bit more control. Sometimes I've had things, and when we've done stuff with just CSV, and they're like, oh, I just want to add, you know, I'm I'm like adding a new property that I want to be able to access it in blueprints. I just want to like add it in, and I want to like populate that from my Google Sheet thing. So there's something we can talk about later. It's it's if there's a way we can do that that doesn't let them get into dependency hell <laughs> like because that's the, the, the how to thread the needle on that is kind of tricky um another interesting thing uh that kind of goes along with the data assets that we'll talk about we might talk about later um is that when you're doing blueprint stuff and you're adding new properties through blueprint you can't set asset bundle information for those new properties there's no there's no UI for it. You can only do the asset bundles there in native. Oh, so wait, so I'm I'm still not super uh, like so asset bundles a way of like kind of grouping up data and so it's not all loaded no, at no, the same time. No, that, that, that's that's in other engines. So in Unreal Engine, it's a bit weird how we're using it. So um, asset bundle is basically it allows you to additionally load soft pointers of a primary asset that you're loading. So, for right. example, let's say you have um, an asset, a primary asset, a blueprint, and has a soft reference. Oh, so like this is, of course, declared in C++. It has a soft uh, pointer to, uh, for example, a texture that is only used in UI. So, because it's a soft object reference, it will not load it automatically. Uh, but you can put it as a part of the UI bundle. And then when you use the asset manager, this only works with the asset manager, by the way, that I'm aware of. When you use the asset manager to load in that primary asset, you can also specify also load the UI bundle. So then, then you'll get those soft references, like uh, soft pointers loaded automatically with it. And then uh, you can show it in UI. And the alternative, if you didn't use yeah, that, Yeah, it's then a really interesting... To... Sorry, go ahead. It, it, it's a really helpful way to like have primary data assets that, um, or assets that have data for a bunch of different contexts mm -hmm. and then load subsections of that data at the times where you need it. So does that mean you have to, so you, the way you do it is you set up an asset bundle and you say, okay, I'm trying to wonder, like, how do you, how do you say that these, it's, these It's just a label on properties. Oh, okay. It's, it's a meta, it's a That's meta tag. It. Uh, yeah, so it's yeah. metadata on the property, which okay. is why you can't do it with a blueprint because you can't um, now this is the case this is the case uh, again kind of jumping ahead of the difference between data assets and blueprints but mm -hmm. if you have a blueprint for a data asset that you're creating instances of and those blueprints add new properties those new properties can't have bundle markup associated with them i mean is that something that I guess I, I, this is more of like a, an engine fundamental thing. Like, is it just because there's no UI for that, or is there no fundamental way of yeah. adding? Like, you could, in theory, like edit the edit, change the editor, change the engine in order to like add 
like a way of it tagging, be, adding metadata? It would be easy. I'm sure you probably it would be could. Easy to add it. Yeah, it would be okay. easy. It just has to be done. Okay. That's, I mean, that's, I know that sucks right now, but like that's, that's somewhat reassuring. Is like, okay, it's not like a fundamental limitation of the engine. That's, that's something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's just something to re. Sorry, you go, go ahead. No, you go first. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just something to under to end up having to be aware of when working with blueprints and also trying to work with asset bundles. Okay. Yeah, thanks for clarifying the asset bundles. I think that's definitely me. I've, the only other time I've touched it is yeah, in Unity, and it's a totally different thing. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so we can talk about data assets then. I think this that seems like it's a good segue to start talking about data assets. Um, uh, before we switch over, did, um, was there any talk about inheritance before I uh, came in? Uh, no, I've mentioned it later as like, oh, I wish we had inheritance like somewhere else, but like I haven't. Yeah, no, that is a nice thing about blueprints. <laughs> And I think that's sort of like, to me, you know, the two kind of main parts that I find appealing about using blueprints as a data format is um, the ability to kind of associate quote unquote code with it, where you can be like, you know, I'm going to have some, some blueprint uh, callable thing in there, uh, blueprint, blueprint implementable thing in there. But the other part is the inheritance aspect of like, you know, defining data that's hierarchical in nature where you know we we can kind of assume that some of these properties are defined on a base class and i'm just going to override a certain aspect of it um and i, I haven't uh, found any other ways to kind of do that in unreal without uh creating any kind of custom tooling um for custom importing like we had that we had a json format um where we would have the editor like an external editor that would generate that kind of um hierarchy mm. that's something like yeah I've, I've kind of wished for like even if it's just like default values and then like kind of like yeah base uh say you've got yeah hundred of hundreds of items it'd be nice to have like okay these are all the healing items have this kind of base and then the, all of these ones have this base and like otherwise you end up with a, a, a csv kind of table with like tons of columns and they're only used for certain certain items and anyway yeah it definitely has its benefits right like i mean the the loading and stuff is is tricky but yeah i think it's, I, I like just yeah, like being able to go through and like yeah it kind of show all the strengths and weaknesses so then when you when you hat when you're trying to just choose what to do then you can yeah you've got all the information available sorry someone else is going to jump wish. in oh yeah sorry. yeah i kind of wish that the um yeah, the data inheritance for blueprints is really nice, and we use it too. The uh, the only place that we get hung up is that the like arrays and container types don't end up functioning the way one might hope sometimes. Oh, um, on a so like if you chart. have yeah, if you so if you have if if your base has an array in it with stuff in it already, and you make your derived type, and you edit the derived type at all. It stops taking any changes as as far as we've been able to tell from the base, oh, even wow. if all you're doing is like removing a single element. Yeah, it does. Okay. go ahead. No, I was just going to say like so if you've made any changes in that particular property, like it's not if you've changed any of the other properties. It's like okay, you've you've modified that array in any way in a child. Then it's just like okay, yeah. you customized it, so ignore any changes. Exactly. Okay. I think the problem is, and and that's kind of the shortcoming of this uh, approach, is that like the this the um, it relies on a per property like is this present in the child or not? It's not. There's no kind of mutation that can happen or transformation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. that's that's kind of like where it's like it's almost a thing you like. You're like, oh, this would be great, but then you're like, actually, what I want is add this element or you know increase this value by ten percent or. <laughs> like more complicated things like that and then it kind of starts falling down again yeah i'm just i'm trying yeah, to imagine I, the ux nightmare you'd have to try and do to like it like okay i'm trying to remove this particular element not this index of this element da, 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 like yeah. right and and it's possible and it and it is possible because i've been doing some stuff with it recently related to delta compression oh. that um maps and sets might actually work i have to go back and double check but for TRAs, yeah, what you were saying is exactly right. Where it just says, "Oh, these two properties are different, so we're going to take the, we're going to take the child, or sorry, we're going to take the derived version and ignore all the changes, any of the values from the parent." I think that's like, yeah, it seems like that's like the safest, least surprising but, way in some ways. Like, but yeah, yeah that, I agree. Yeah, that's it's like... you know, 
deltas between two arrays is really hard, so <laughs> we can understand why it does that. Yeah, it uh, seems that the only place. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, that seems that the only place where they they just try to fix is like gameplay effects with attack containers added and removed that then get merged into a single one. But that's like indeed three properties, keeping keeping count of all the other things that have been added or removed from parent. So yeah, maybe not ideal in that case. Mm. It's possible with gameplay tags then, maybe? Like, is that what well, That's what he's saying, is it's a particular feature of gameplay effects that have gameplay tag containers oh. and three separate arrays that at runtime are merged into a single array. Oh, I see, yes, right. So you don't have to try and get, like, get into it what they're trying to do from a single array, okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm still getting, I'm very much like a UI one trick. I'm still getting into like, oh, right, gameplay tags are a thing. Okay. I think the other thing with the inheritance, the particular call out is the hard reference hell that was already alluded to. But this is a particular issue that actually ran, that Valorant ran into with how they were authoring some skin structures where within Blueprint where like an upgraded version of a skin or like a third version of a weapon was just a derived child. But what that meant was that like level three weapon would also load everything from its parent level two weapon, which is you know very bad. Right, I see. Right, when they're the, yeah, you don't need to. There is actually a separate thing, but you do want the inheritance. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, that's tricky. Cool. Uh, I think to your point earlier, Ben, but in terms of just like list, listing the pros and cons, I definitely think that's a a need that I've had is like when I come into, you know, a team and we're talking about like, hey, you know, try to teach people how to use Unreal or how to solve problems um, with the tools that are available. Um, one of the common problems that I have is like, you know, need to explain to, like to people how do you, like what is the decision making process for picking data structures for, you know, um, content that's going to be edited by other people. Um, and I it feel like almost, you know, distilling this whole round table into like a flow graph or like a flow chart <laughs> like <laughs> here are the decisions you should make uh, you yeah, know would be would be valuable that'd be great like are you are you trying to make a something like no then okay you can't use this like okay that's kind of <laughs> that'd be I, I mean i don't know if it's gonna be that simple that would be wonderful <laughs> like, yeah no i don't i don't think <laughs> it's for sure but you know at least a, a new way, funny like, one. <laughs> yeah uh, and like here's how you like here's here's how this is a subtle foot gun it is always i think a useful thing to share mm. I think that, yeah, until you hit one of those like in, in production where you're like, oh, oh, okay, we are, we're loading the entire game. Like I've definitely done the like accidentally load the entire game to try and show like a wiki. I, no, I've done that. Like that's, <laughs> I've done that before. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds to me like maybe we all have because we definitely for uh, State of Decay 2, we had massive problems with like the game mode references the list of zombies and the zombies list, you know, all these other things and then you simply hitting play in the editor or even loading a map in the editor that had that game mode would just suddenly you know take forever because you suddenly were scraping every single asset off of disk into memory Good. the player bp in city sample loads three gigabytes of data because it winds up going down a billy print that loads hard reference every vehicle cool. okay that's that's it that's so that's from chat that's kind of uh reassuring that that's something that exists in a in an epic example <laughs> like we've all done it Okay, so we object there at the demo. Okay, we can look at some of these later. Um, so I, we've talked a bit about the primary data assets, right? Like you can say that the the wait no that was a primary asset. Uh, what's a secondary asset then? Is that the same thing? A secondary asset is really just is probably is more or less just a data asset that's not a primary data asset okay that's, it's just a regular yeah, it's yeah it's like anything that a primary asset references and gets cooked as a result of that i see okay so i guess if it's not referenced from anything then it's not either primary okay 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 we can do yeah that's i don't want to read too much documentation during this but okay um this is something like a random idea that i we've talked about before as like okay it's nice to have blueprints for uh you know adding in code and it's nice to have things like in the editor so they get cooked and you can mess with them but like has anyone done anything weird like kind of trying to populate uh data assets or blueprints from external yes, actually. Yeah, it, yeah, uh, it was actually ended up being one of my favorite solutions to all the problems you're kind of describing oh. here so far 
Because what, what ended up happening is we have that problem where we want our data assets to be like related to the thing. Like I mean, if you have a weapon, you want all the stats and stuff like that in the weapon. You want all the assets and soft references and everything in that weapon. So you can just load it and get the thing you want and not have to reference everything else like you would end up doing with a data table. Um, but designers don't really like that as much because sometimes they like to have like a single big CSV with all those numbers and stats and everything all in the same place for context and, and tuning and all the rest. And it's totally reasonable and much better way to work. So what we actually ended up doing is we, um, it, was, it was kind of a really simple hack. We just kind of went in there and we said, you know, when we save the data asset, go read the information from a CSV. And that CSV um, was sort of like a path we could set up for the data asset. Uh, and it ended up having um, a row where the primary um, key name of the data asset was like the, 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 the row name for, and then all the columns or all the stats that we wanted to import into like a data structure. Neat. And then if that read from save flag was checked, we would just sort of like gray out the block so it was clearly not non mutable right um and you kind of got the best of both worlds because like data assets do things where they're like it's it's kind of all like an editor memory so like if you change a number at runtime if you're playing the game actively it changes as well so you could like if you're just trying to tune and change a particular weapon you kind of like uncheck that you play with the sliders you find the numbers you have your data validation and your other things mm -hmm. and then um when you're happy with it, you're like, okay, these are the good numbers. You go, you take it, and you put it in the master um, CSV table, right? And then you can also compare and contrast it against the other stuff that you have. Neat. Um, yeah, Would that you took export a step. from the data asset into the CSV too. Uh, no, it's so the the basically the the CSV is the master in this particular case, and the data asset has a flag that says I'm taking my data from the master uh, from that CSV, and so we we like copied. Um, like the sort of data table parsing code that's in, that's like, you know, parsed from CSV and stuff like that. And we just wrote our own little parser to basically go and just like take a struct and then read that struct from whatever data, uh, sorry, whatever CSV table we're pointing to in the data asset. But yeah, like ideally, you, I guess, I, I don't know if ideally or if you actually want this feature like, of like, okay, you've messed around with it in the editor, you've tuned it, it's wonderful. Instead of having to like manually go to your CSV and like input those things, like having a little like button to to save it back out to the CSV. I mean, you're you're kind of playing with fire a little yeah. bit there. <laughs> but so our 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 pattern or our, our process was always like always change the CSV, and after you've changed the CSV, just resave every data asset of that particular type, just to make sure things don't go out of sync. So it's like it's not entirely perfect, but like mm. we kind of just like made that the rule, and then we just didn't worry about things going out of sync, and like. I, I, I sort of worried about things like that at first, mm -hmm. <laughs> but then like for the entirety of our projects, like, you know, nothing went wrong. Like it was a pretty easy process to follow. Okay. I'm kind of curious at that point, because if you like, basically you generate a bunch of, a bunch of data asset and the only reason you have the data asset is so you can kind of tweak it at runtime, right? As far as like the game is concerned, the data asset is the master source. Right, and so the, the the game doesn't even really at runtime doesn't even know about the CSV, and so there are other like benefits to having data assets like data bundling, uh, uh, asset bundles, and stuff like that that resolve a lot of loading problems, um, and also um, to like the to Ben's point up above about like how do you handle mod and DLC compatibility and things like that where you just want to like. At some point down the line, you want to add more of a particular kind of item or you want to add more customizations or things like that. When your data is broken up into assets, you can just add more assets and then the content just gets added by virtue of the assets being present. Right. So there's like really nice benefits to data assets in those particular regards. So that's one of the reasons that we like to use them a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it sounds it sounds awesome. I could just check yeah. the right the tooling to to do that. Like, I, I guess kind of like interesting, like thinking about the like does the game does the game know the CSV exists externally? Like that's kind of true of even even data tables, right? Like they it's still just loading the data table asset, not the actual external text file. Um, but yeah, it might, it might yeah. yeah, yeah. 
we had a similar like I, I alluded to it earlier that we had a similar solution at Undead where we were um, you know we had an external editor which was helpful for creating kind of hierarchical data that that had transformation kind of transformation based data and this is also for guns um, but that would flatten out to um, to uh, uh, at first it was a CSV format and there was a whole there was a whole pipeline but the <laughs> that was pretty broken at it different times but originally it was uh you know i think generating a data table and then there was an operation in the editor that would convert that data table into a uh, into different assets um and to the question of like what are the benefits of doing this right like uh for fun one of it it was you know being able to reference other assets and have them just kind of load you know alongside the asset like be able to use all the data um pipeline um for that the other part of it that was helpful for us was um we had a hybrid model where the numbers that were like different disciplines cared about different parts of the of the asset and it turned out to be kind of a bottleneck to have them all go through the same tools and so the hierarchical editing was mostly used for stats and you know kind of managing you know oh yeah this is a, a you know, we had a you know there's a lot of guns in standard k2 like there's a, there's a ton of guns and so there's like, you know, this is a sniper rifle of this variety. And so we're going to have that set a bunch of base stats. And then we kind of want to, you know, have it flow down from that. And I think a lot of games struggle with more like a balancing act when they're looking at guns. It's a lot of like, you know, how do they play together? And so you want to be able to look at all of them. Um, but for State of Decay, there was more of like a, you know, consistency and variation was more important because the, the balancing was, you know, it's not a, Competitive, like it wasn't a competitive multiplayer and that kind of a thing. Um, but uh, the audio team, for example, didn't give any crap about you know being able to share this data between them, and so they would just be able to go edit the blueprint assets that were on disk uh, and change some of the properties on there and say like, hey, you know, set this flag in WIs or you know whatever. Um, and so that so the pipeline would only update the assets, and so if they already existed, they wouldn't. Uh, st stomp the properties that were not imported from um, in the end it was came from JSON uh, when I left but um, yeah the JSON assets would kind of override the properties rather than uh, recreate the asset that's interesting to think about like the different I've definitely hit the, the like different people want different views onto the same data um, like did you did you end up with issues like so I guess the benefit of like having a single data asset for like, okay, you, this is a sniper rifle. It's got all the audio, it's got all of the balancing, it's got all of the animations. Like, so I guess, yeah, visual, audio, and then like gameplay balance. But like, did you have issues with, or has anybody had any issues with like, if that's a single data asset, don't you end up like kind of checking it out and sort of blocking other people from that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's always, and that was part of why we moved away from the data table was because that was like a choke point that was terrible or everybody had to check it out. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it definitely means that like if you want to change one of the basic like types and so that it cascades out to a lot of the assets, it would be problematic. Uh, but I think the part of the benefit of moving this between two different editing flows is that like mostly only the you know, systems designers would be actually care about like modifying a massive amount of this, you know, data. Um, and so it would be a pain point if you did that. But most of the time you were kind of like adding new leaf nodes to this hierarchy, like especially after the game was kind of like, you know, shipped when we kept adding new stuff. It was just like, yeah, you're adding a few leaf nodes at the end. And so you would just be modifying the assets that were actually changed because we did a little delta comparison before we checked anything out. And so you wouldn't um, be modifying any assets that like it didn't have any changes. That's a good point just to com yeah, compare to data tables. Like if you're adding to add a new something, whatever it is, like for a blueprint or for a data asset, it's like, well, you don't need to check everything out that is already exists, but for a data table, you kind of do to, I mean, as far as I understand, like you have to check the asset out. Depends on like whether you're importing from other stuff, but like, yeah, that that's, that's a good, that's a good comparison. Um, yeah. The, anything else on data assets? Anyone wants to? Bring up. No, I, I was gonna hey. say like I think that's the main issue for me with data assets. Like I, I like the principle of it, but from uh like the the, the fact that it's not mergeable, mm -hmm. and the fact that it's not like you know you can defeat, um, and you're kind of stuck with, you know this the, the systems. I feel like you know having a backing CSV or JSON format for them kind of kind of makes sense. But also like coming back to your point of having different views on the same asset. 
I know that designers don't tend to like editing JSON, mm -hmm. but it's a good like programmer, uh, like programmer kind of, of visualization. And also like the other issue I encountered was um, like you, you kind of need to boot the editor to 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 check your your data asset. And when you have code that kind of depends on like you know keys set up in your in your data assets, like on, on a JSON you can just open the JSON in your normal editor. Mm -hmm. But for that asset, you're kind of stuck being needing to boot the game, like to boot the editor to check what's the content of the asset, and at the same time, that means you need the editor in a you know in a in a compilable states. Yes. But if you're coding, then it might not be compilable. So you you know. Um, I've definitely been in that situation where I'm like, I just want to edit this one thing. That means oh no, I can't edit it, so I have to make do some like if statements so I can actually launch it. Like yeah, I think I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to make yeah, it runnable. For sure. And on a similar front, when you are required to have Unreal-based representation of the data, um, obviously external services don't have that representation, such as if you need a, a web store to be able to purchase a skin outside the game, you need a data representation for that skin that is not that can be also be fed into the game. Yep. That's what Has anyone... Um, experimented with kind of a hybrid approach because this is the thing that I like I don't know it's almost like a a white whale to me is like the idea of in the editor you kind of uh, transparently consume JSON uh, in the form of a U like in the form of a U object where like you can set up some kind of U object representation like a data asset um, but in the editor it just consumes the the .json files, and then when you cook, it will actually generate U assets for it and and cook those in. Um, and and kind of the appeal for me in that one is that like I don't want to be, um, I don't want to have to deal with binary assets on disk, both from the perspective of like perforce locking and from um, we talked about merging. You know, like the the mergeability of the assets. Like I know that these are totally mergeable text assets, and so I don't care. Um, you know, um, about the perforce. Uh, locking um and so yeah like has anyone kind of gone down that path at all i haven't personally but another project is doing that when it comes to automatic code generation as part of a packaging chat for um for this like web services interface layer so just to like so, so you the just to rephrase the the idea so that you would have when you're running in the editor, you're like consuming the the raw text file kind of like directly without going through, like updating a bunch of um, data assets or whatever. But then, just for cooking, you update the Kate data assets, and so I guess you wouldn't you you don't need to ship the CSV or the JSON. It's just like that's the quick, like in editor yeah. approach. Is that we kind of had like a similar like on a non Unreal project? It was uh, basically you have like kind of your runtime, you know, binary format, and you have a backing like uh, text format. So during development, you can only work with the text format. But when it's time to ship, you like your 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 uh, your engine is able to like kind of load either of the format transparently. So you know from a coding standpoint, it looks the same. But like the the backing representation, like the on disk representation, can be either text or binary. And you kind of have, you know, during development, you kind of work on the text format. And once you you, you get to ship, you can uh, you can kind of cook all your text format to to a binary. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, at that point, it's not mergeable, but like it's smaller, it takes less space, and you know, you can it's uh, it's, yeah. it's better for the for the customer. But uh, on during development, you can uh, you can merge. You don't have the, the the exclusive checkout issues and stuff like that. And that that kind of works. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's you know I think that's exactly the kind of flow that I'm thinking about here, and uh, and Ben, I think you're you're correct there. The it's kind of like one way to think about it is um, there's been some talk of like text based U asset serialization. Like that's a I know that's a an ongoing project of research at Epic. Like, uh, and you know it's kind of that, but with the ability to control the serialization format, right? Like, I want to be able to just use, for example, JSON or whatever instead of, you know, no no disrespect to Epic, but I fucking hate that text-based uh, serialization format. <laughs> the weird, like, parentheses-based, uh, you know, not quite JSON. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, like, 
and and I would live with that. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't turn my nose up if if you know UE five one shipped tomorrow with you know the custom text based serialization. I would you know absolutely love it. But um, I, I, the dream world is you know just that the editor doesn't have to care about uh, any binary assets at all. It just knows how to you know de deserialize the text files. That'd be cool. I don't know. Like the other thing, I've sort of slightly related to that. Of thinking, uh, we were thinking about if there's a way, if if the designers, so in our in our case, the designers are working like primarily in in Google Sheets, and we were like, well, why can't we just like when you hit play in the editor, if you're running an editor, just download the latest stuff from Google Sheets. Like if it's and if there's no connection, you just use whatever you've got in CSV. Like just so then they don't have to like. I don't know. I guess it's it's only slightly different to like when you run the editor, download it to CSV, and then load from the CSV. It's kind of like the same thing, but it depends on yeah what your what your dev what your designers and what your friend people are like most comfortable with. Like, do they want to edit CSVs locally? Do they use like Excel? Do they use Google Sheets? What do they use? Yeah. Well, this is really interesting. Like, I think yeah, thinking about that, like having that's something that it seems like it would it would be possible to to do in a in a project I, I haven't done this but i think i saw someone said like they would use like a monitor process like a separate process to actually pull the status of the like you know the google sheet to auto import at, while the game is running oh neat that would be cool yeah like so it's like live really updating <laughs> cool well we talked about um you know, the, like people have mentioned, like getting things out of sync, and that's always like a, a thing that I'm scared of when it comes to, especially just like US that's in general that are not the source of truth. When you have an external source of truth, uh, the things getting out of sync is something we've struggled with in the past, mm -hmm. um, and in some cases it's been worse because we have like either a, a Google spreadsheet, a Google Google sheet, or an Excel document, and then we export that to CSV. Or a, which is goes into a data table, which then you know is the thing that drives the game. And then you might, as like, well, what I've seen often happen is like, uh, there was no, at least historically, there was no way to market our data table as read only. And so people would be like, where does this data come from? Oh, it comes from this data table. And they would just go in and start editing the data table and be like, cool, fix that bug. And then, you know, a week later, somebody updates the CSV and stomps on all their changes. And then you're just like, whoops, that's gone. Um, and so finding ways to kind of prevent the, the mishaps where the data is out of sync, like marking assets as read-only or things like that, uh, is interesting to me. Is, um, has anyone mm. experimented with read-only uh, data assets or, or, or data tables without marking every field in the struct as visible instead of editable? <laughs> I guess that would work. <laughs> There's different ways like philosophically I've approached that kind of thing where we have a pretty custom validation plugin that works on save to this warn about anything and then I'll do auto corrections as well beyond just like the epic type. So for instance, um, we like I don't I restrict nothing in like our gameplay directories can reference anything in our UI directory as an example like from a referencing perspective and similar when it comes to like whether things can be saved at all um there you can do like different rules checks in the past i've done at the perforce level where only certain people with certain in, within a certain group are allowed to save or check out a file well that's cool the like a similar ish issue, I think, if I understood correctly, like we the, the way we kind of deal with it is having a, a CI step um, that kind of exported auto automatically from the the source assets, and if they detected the difference in the output, then that would like uh, you know turn the CI red, uh, and that kind of that helped a lot uh, avoiding those kind of sync issues between when you have a master asset that kind of drive uh, a, a built like a cooked asset. Um, yeah, be, putting that in your CI and having a, a, a validations check that that you know when when your CI uh, computer like machine um, make sure like it doesn't you know pull stuff from Perforce or something or you know ch check out the files it, you know it must be able to diff the Perforce file from what it has locally, mm -hmm. which isn't that hard to to implement but you know you kind of have to work it out um, and yeah. 
the cooking that in the in the CI is kind of important, and having having those validation steps is kind of is gets important when you when you start having those kind of of of, of assets. This is really useful. Yeah. Uh, any other data asset stuff? I mean, we're sort of also talking about data, data tables. We're sort of like blending into the next thing. Um, uh, yeah. Any more data asset specific stuff we want to bring up? Mentioned a little bit custom validation. I just want to yeah. make a shout out for the asset validation plugin in Unreal that comes with it. It's absolutely amazing, and everyone should use it. You can make validation rules in both C++ or Blueprint, and you can even run it while you're cooking the game so that it will like uh, fail the build if it doesn't, uh, you know, approve all the you know validation. And uh, yeah, it's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely like I've, I I wrote like a little plugin for data validation. And I just sort of dipped my toe, and I'm like, oh, I didn't need to do this. There's already a plugin. <laughs> like it made it way easier. I didn't need to, yeah, write a bunch of custom stuff. Um, it's one of the two things I always tell uh, like studios. There's these two things that you're probably not using enough, and that's mm -hmm. the asset validation and the editor utility widgets. Yes. Well, no, I will note a few things on the default one which like it's good for most things but like we we, we have a custom one that was where i started from that is there's two big faults is the first fault is that it loads the object as part of the reference checks so like i haven't actually done this yet but my plan is to use asset data so you have soft pass when you so a lot of validation things you don't need to actually load the full object class to perform validation on it that just slows oh. down validation and just other other aspects of that and the second part is just I often want to auto-correct things, like there's common just errors or warnings that we just want to change them automatically. An example like what I wrote recently was, within our characters, the only thing that should ever have any collision is our collision capsule. So if anything has any, like a static mesh was added, just like, you know, a new like club weapon that is purely visual, but its default static mesh properties had collision, so I just switch it to no collision through validation. That's neat. For me, the uh, loading has never been a problem because it runs usually when you're saving the asset, when it's already loaded, or when it's cooking. And of course, I guess in your case, it would be when you're right-clicking an asset or a folder, then doing validated assets on that. Then yeah, it would have to load them all. Yeah, I mean, like even but even when cooking though, it's like we do incremental packages. So like right now, like my new project's not bad, but in a full project where cooks can take, you know. Like a PC cook is thirty minutes, a console or iOS, a Android cook are hours upon hours. Um, so if you want to decrease that, you want to make your all aspects of the CI as fast as possible. And then on a similar front, something I haven't done yet that I'm planning to do is as a pre-submit check, run validation. So people are forced to run validation even before it gets into CI in the first place. Mm. So I want that to be as fast as possible. Yeah, definitely. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say forcing a pre-submit test is kind of like I don't I don't know if you can bake that into Unreal as a like editor utility or something that that would be nice, like being able to force a running an external process that that runs your CI locally, because I I don't know how like the CI is integrated into like you know, like usually people have Jenkins or Team or stuff like that and that's not like integrated into Unreal easily, mm. and being able to like kind of run those processes. Um, you know, that would be nice. I think there's some stuff I've seen with Beforce where you can like, I swear I saw this at Don't Nod where they were like, you you could get it to run a command before you could actually submit your change list or something. Like if you yeah, then you yeah. could run a command lit just to hammer the thing. I would I would highly recommend you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the, okay, but uh, but I think that like the concept is good, but I think that like the um. You want to be kind of careful of what you put into your perforce triggers in terms of uh, both dependencies, complexity, and runtime. Um, it can be pretty error prone, and it can be a bad time when you when you go dig yourself down that path. I think um, what I've considered in the past to what uh, what uh, Daniel was saying, like the um, having you know you can easily check like is there some kind of token in the in the change list description, um, and then you can have tools that kind of generate those tokens for you. Um, and so, like, the pre-submit could be, you know, you can't submit unless you have this token that says you've run the validation. Uh, if you're 
paranoid or you have a large team, you can have that token be something that's like gotten from a service or something. But you know, otherwise, you can just be like there's some particular text fragment that's added when you run local tooling that does some kind of validation um, that maybe includes the hashes of the assets, and so you can very quickly verify that all the tools have been run on the content before it's submitted. Um, and you know, since Ari was first started pitching, uh, I'm assuming. I'm assuming you work on the data validation team, Ari. <laughs> um, and so I'm just going <laughs> to pitch my own my own pet project, which is, uh, I, I wrote something called US at RS, which is a, a US at uh, metadata uh, library for Rust. Um, and the use case I have for it right now is that we actually use that in our pre-submit uh, triggers for, uh, or sorry, pre-commit, I think. Sorry, these terms are very specific in Pro First Land, but um, before it actually uh, finalizes the change, it will download the assets that you're about to submit and then uh, run US at RS on it to verify that all the assets uh, have versions. Like, that's the one thing we have right now because we use UGS, and so to prevent people from checking stuff in that doesn't have a version tag, so we can't tell whether it's like compatible with other stuff. Um, and the next part of that is going to be uh, because you can very easily read the exports and imports for an asset. So just be able to tell that um, all the assets that are referenced by the asset have been checked in, because that's probably our most common uh, content kind of build failure is when somebody adds a new asset and that asset references a new material and that material got imported into UE, but UE doesn't P4 add the asset until you save it, I think. Um, and so it looks fine in the editor, but then they'll check it in and then it'll break the build. Yep, I've been there. Yes. Yeah. An, an asset actually only exists on the file drive when you save it for the first time. Until then, it only exists in memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I think it like it could definitely I, like I think what I would have liked is just perforce like when you import a new asset, just like you know s automatically save it after importing uh, prompt the P four add because it'll add references to other like to that asset in other assets, right? So you can very easily get yourself into a state. I, that's why I often tell people like before you submit, maybe you should just quit the editor because <laughs> you can't. It's much harder to screw things up in that case. Mm -hmm. These are really useful. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, I guess we can move on to data tables. I know we keep sort of jumping around various things. Um, Whoever added that note about the row type metadata, I don't know if that's new or if I've just never seen it, but that's amazing, and I'm so glad it exists. This one, yeah, I uh, I had I looked at my old uh, I had a tutorial, and I was like, oh, it sucks. You can't choose the you can't like there's no way of choosing the row type, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, sucks. And then I looked and I'm checking Unreal 5 and it's there now. So I don't know how new it is, but it's there now. So <laughs> it might be 2.7 or, or 5, but yeah, you can specify like a particular row, row type when you're pointing to a specific row. Um, you can also yeah, do it when you're pointing to a specific table of, with a specific row. Um, so yeah, I guess we've already talked about like the single point of authority stuff. Um, I guess any yeah, someone's mentioned you already mentioned like the the issue with like okay you've got a web version of your CSV and you've downloaded that and then you've got a CSV file and then you import the data table and you're like okay which one of these three is the like the what do you call it the the source of truth the the single point of authority um, uh, yeah we had kind of an honor system but it sounds like there's some other alternatives for like you know locking the file through perforce or like making all the U properties within the data table like read only, but then the, yeah, that sucks if you're trying to like actually and uh, change values like while you're running the game, um, which is something. Yeah, I don't know if that's um, so. In the the you know, as I was saying, kind of tongue in cheek, marking all the properties as visible anywhere <laughs> instead of edit anywhere. Um, the uh, in my experience, and this was I haven't used data tables since we since I went to my new studio, but uh, at, back in like four thirteen or wherever we were on. Data tables didn't actually like um, respect the editability of the properties, and so even if you did mark them as oh, visible yeah. anywhere, not anywhere, you could edit it through the data table UI. Yes, I think, yeah, I think you're right. Like, but that might have been a bug that potentially got fixed. Yeah, I remember you can like double click on stuff, and then and then you can edit it, and then there's a way of exporting back out. But like, it's 
yeah, I don't know. It, it's I'm not entirely sure. I don't. I think guess the workflow is like expected to be like you fill it from CSV and you create the data table and then you don't touch the CSV anymore and you just use the the data table asset itself as the as the authority. Um, I'm not super sure. Um, it seems like I don't know if it seems like it's maybe aimed at like smaller projects or smaller teams or something. I don't know if people are using it in bigger bigger projects. Um, because I guess once you've got enough people, you can start writing your own kind of tooling or uh, that sort of thing. I think Epic said that they use data tables for Paragon, at least. Um, okay. I don't think that it's intended to be like a, you know, toy throwaway tool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of specific to your flow, right? Like how you're using it. And so it can be... Uh, I think there's many ways to use it that are maybe not ideal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, composite data tables is something that I've heard of that I haven't really used very much, and I know that they like related to to data registers, which is this new Unreal Five experimental plugin. I don't know if anyone's got any experience with that. I feel a bit clueless talking about this. I haven't done enough research on that yet. Uh, has anyone dealt with with data registers or composite data tables much? Um. Oh, one thing as well, I, did, I guess maybe not then. It seemed like it was a way of like grouping together, like you can have multiple data tables and, and kind of have a view onto multiple data tables. And that's what a composite data table is, right? Yeah, I, I've been using them in our current project. Okay. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like if you, it, when it does that, is it is it like saving a, a kind of like a, a merged version of the other data tables or is it is it just a view onto the other? The, the individual ta data tables? Um, it keeps a reference to all of the other data tables, and it's I'm, I'm not 100% certain, but I think it's just a view into it. And when you access, uh, it reaches into those to find the, the specific row that you're looking for. OK. OK, that seems useful. Like I was, I was kind of trying to think of like use cases. I guess it, it would be like you want to have a view onto all items, but maybe you have items like these are the hunter items, these are the druid items. Like, is that? When you, why you'd want to have like separate data tables, but then also have a merged view. Like... Yeah, um, yeah, actually, that's one of the one of the exact use cases that we've been using it for. Um, okay. We also were using it to split up so that uh, multiple people could be editing data and have it uh, sort of you know head up into that one single location. So it, it broke up the uh, this you know the file needs to be checked out by multiple people problem. That's nice. Yeah, because that's the other thing. Otherwise, yeah, you you just end up with like a single thing with like thousands of rows and stuff in it. Like, I can see how that'd be useful for like, yeah, well, these are the level specific items, or these are the level specific like, uh, yeah, data or the character specific data. Yep, okay. precisely. Similarly, like we haven't got to this yet, but as you get into more modular content structure in the game feature plugin kind of world, or even when you have version content and seasonal content you'll have your evergreen weapons but then you have one-off weapons for this particular time period and you want to define that in separate data but then at runtime you may want to combine it as part of your asset management structure so i imagine i'm imagining like composite data tables and the registry dynamic lookup is what you kind of want that for where you can't or where you can't and you don't actually want the hard reference at, at tool time but you want them to be uh, merged at runtime yeah, one of the uh, more interesting things is that um, as you add more tables to this view, um, if you have identical row names, the later ones will squash the earlier ones, which is like you know something to be aware of as a problem. But it introduces some interesting um, DLC management stuff where you can overwrite earlier content rows with more recent stuff. Okay. Just writing that down for later because that seems very useful to know. Well, yeah, it definitely uh, it caught us. That one, that one was a, an interesting data bug that was harder to track down. I mean, yeah, it sounds like yeah, it's, it's a it's a bug if you don't know about it. It's a feature if it's like it can be useful, I guess. Yeah, but that that would certainly surprise me. Like, <laughs> cool. Um, it also, I, I guess it's related. Like the so when I was looking at data registries, it, it seems like it's a new plugin, and it was saying that like, oh, you can. It's the difference between it is what was that quote? Uh, it's like what was it? it, it it's a run. It's a, so you can store curved data in addition. Just a, oh, okay, in direction layer rather than manually composing. So I was I was trying to understand like whether data registers these work for like grouping together data tables at runtime and composite data tables can't 
do that? Like when you were saying like, oh, what if you had a, a bunch of DLC, would a, a composite data table like actually be able to find all the data tables that exist at runtime? Or do you have to like... Uh, yeah, I think I, can, I think it can because um, I'm seeing it in the Lyra starter uh, kind of project where they can add a data point to the data registry from a game future plugin. So they can do that at runtime. Right. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I yeah, I think that's what the data registries. Yeah, that's the like the yeah. benefit of it. But I, I guess that's why they're adding it as a as a new thing rather than if the tables can't do that. Um, I, I sorry, I'm like very new. I haven't done DLC and stuff. Um, so, uh, also I don't know like the the stuff people were talking about before with with bundles and like uh using metadata to specify certain these assets uh like these soft references are like related to these bundles. I, I guess you can do that in data tables still because it would just still be a, like a U property, I guess. Um, I, don't I don't think it actually works that way because the the way those bundles work is they're tied to specific primary asset IDs and each row of the table won't have, wouldn't have a unique asset ID. The table itself would, but okay. each individual row wouldn't. Okay, so... You... Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm interested in potential solutions there because I kind of I really like the asset bundle system and leverage it a lot, and it's one of the reasons I kind of don't end up using the tables for much of anything, um, or at least I wouldn't end up using them for anything that has actual content references. To be fair, the uh, the whole like asset bundles how it works is not that much code. It's only the asset manager that does it. Like it's not built into the engine. It's only if you load things through the asset manager. And we always suggest to studios that are doing any kinds of like a bit more than not complicated asset management to extend and create their own. So uh, like the only thing you have to do is load in the main asset, load in all the soft pointers manually, and then call a, you know, an event when it's done. That's it. That's all that the uh, asset uh, bundles do now currently. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and we do have our own version of the asset manage of the asset manager to do some things, and we've customized it a bit. Um, it's just one of those things where it just doesn't. Yeah, it um, still thinks you have to do it yourself. Okay, well, it seems like it's extendable. That like is that you could do it for individual rows in a data table. Then is that what you're saying? It's a really Please. funny thing when you talk about extendable and the asset ma manager because uh, they wanted or like we wanted to make it really extendable, so <laughs> we just went and marked every single function in it virtual. That's it. <laughs> I'll take it. That's nice. Like sometimes I'll find the fun. I'm trying to do something in Unreal and I'm like, why is this private? Why is this non-virtual? Like, <laughs> like yeah, I don't know. I'll take it. <laughs> it's uh, the one thing that I've found. You know, when it comes to customization, and I don't know if this is kind of true for the asset stuff too. Um, but you know, the you you can't really uh, do anything meaningful with the header parsing and and U class and U property metadata um, without modifying the engine. And so, like you know, add it. You can add, add arbitrary meta tags, but those aren't available at runtime. And so, if you want to do kind of like markup on properties that you want to be able to use, for example, from your custom asset manager. Um, that becomes hard as far as I understand it. Um, but feel free to correct me. But funnily enough, the asset bundles, uh, because they're using the metadata, but they still get kind of cooked into the game. What it's doing is to, as just, I think it's just cooking it like by saving those U properties and putting it into like a hidden, like serialized thing or in the, was it the asset registry? So yeah, basically like we're feeling the effect ourselves and like from our point of view, there is, I don't think there's a single reason why you shouldn't just make it like not stripped out in editor builds. Like people are, other studios have been doing it just fine. And uh, honestly, myself, I don't know why we just don't make it like also in non-editor builds. Mm. I've definitely had that thought on many, many, many times. And <laughs> I think at one point I talked about submitting a pull request that was just like studio specific <laughs> property one and studio specific property two. So you can like, you know, have some silly kind of accessibility there. Uh, okay. 
I guess we can jump on to CSV then. Like the idea here is like, what if what if not data tables, but you just like something we've already talked about with like populating. What if you just populated um, data assets from CSV, like uh, or, or similarly any other kind of like plain text format, um, like. Okay, I guess you've already you've already talked about that. Like someone told me the other day on on the Discord, like you can something that we had issues with with the previous game is like uh, if you're just using CSV, well, we were using XML, then yeah, the Unreal doesn't know about like assets that you've referenced from that and not from anywhere else in the game. So like the one way of doing that is is like telling the telling the added asset manager that like oh please add these um, these reference these reference assets to like the build to the cooked. Uh, to the cooking process um yeah i don't know if anyone's only got any other kind of like text related stuff they use i guess we can just open up to like any uh, xml yaml toml all these other weird formats has anyone dealt with those or use those i think i was the one who added yaml on there um yeah. and uh we use that currently in the title that's in development um and that's you know, I think somebody previously mentioned that like JSON is a very programmer kind of uh, text format. Um, and I came into this company and there was kind of a strong culture of uh, designers editing YAML. Like that was just like a thing they, they have always done. Um, and, you know, so it's a little more user friendly from an editing perspective. And we do some VS Code extensions and things like that for formatting and, and validation and that kind of stuff. Um, and then we run then we load that YAML at runtime. And so we there's no there are no U S that's involved in that process. Um, which means that, you know, there's kind of a um, manual translation uh, at load time from uh, U, from YAML to a U struct. Um, or I guess this is a struct. Um, no, it's probably a U struct. But anyway, um, and then we, you know, use the the thing that I mentioned about the modify cook override on the asset manager, so that we can inject the assets that are referenced by our YAML into the cook pipeline. Um, but I haven't, I'm, like, people keep talking about primary and secondary assets, and I haven't really done much work, like, looked into that much at all. And so for us, you know, this flow is pretty manual, and so we, you know, we'll load the all the JS, all the YAML at startup. Um, like when you load into the level or whatever, and then you know, as we need to spawn these actors or whatever, we'll kind of like manually do async loading of the required assets uh, because they're all you know soft references and they won't be uh, loaded automatically. Yeah, that's something that's basically identical to what we did for Industries of Titan, but with XML instead of YAML. <laughs> like, yeah, like trying to yeah asynchronously load the stuff as it's used. Um, like the only yeah, the 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 downsides of like not having any um your objects and stuff is like we don't uh, mostly we didn't really use much blueprints in that like all the all the kind of gameplay code was just done by programmers i wonder if anybody's like ever dealt with trying to have external data formats and making them blueprint friendly because it's like okay you add a property to your yaml or your toml or your xml or whatever anything like either a programmer is going to have to go in and add a new property to the cs to the c plus plus or uh and then make sure that's populated and then the blueprints can access it and stuff and it's just a, like a bit gunky if you're trying to go with blueprints but i guess if you're trying to go with blueprints you probably just go straight for like a, a stable or a blueprint uh asset or a data asset i don't know if anyone's got thoughts about that uh, in the past we've done um uh, for Seder K2, we did a lot of JSON deserialization um, at runtime and things like that, where we would load, for example, like as a way to be able to provide live patching without needing to cook assets, we would provide like JSON blobs that lived on title storage or, you know, whatever the kind of platform specific um, service was. Um, and uh, while we didn't particularly care about that being extensible, it was kind of like an you know, originally defined data. Um, but, you know, we, we used uStruct uh, definitions, so like any any blueprint can, can fit into that bucket, um, where you can just enumerate the properties that are available on the type and use that as a new deserialization um, schema. And um, so, like in theory, that approach could work, I think, uh, with blueprint classes, right? Because they will define all of their properties as 
um, as U properties, and you can or F properties, I guess now, um, but uh, in code, and you can use that to to do whatever custom JSON deserialization you want to. Oh, so then in that case, a designer could like, okay, I added a new property to my whatever text format, and then I want to use that in the game. I c could add a similar uh, variable into the the blueprint, and then it would get filled, right? Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yep. That's kind of neat. I don't know if that's like a, it's kind of an odd hybrid of like of like oh let's just try and keep the data outside of Unreal, but then let's do the gameplay inside Unreal, like the blueprint stuff. Like that's an interesting hybrid. I don't know if I'm worth trying that. That'd be kind of cool. Um, I'm also kind of curious about like any like I know any files are like you know that when you mark stuff as config, things get saved out as like any files. I'm kind of curious like if anyone's done anything wacky with that like. I don't know why. I just I look at it and I'm like, it's a data format. Like it's simple. Like yeah, we, I was we hoping we would primarily for. The... Oh, sorry. That... Go ahead, Ari. I, I just said I was hoping we wouldn't skip over that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've used them primarily for uh, default values of um, of data assets for cases where sometimes the. Um, where it's not easy to set them with default values, usually like content references, where the CPP definition of a data asset has a, would be a thing that's a soft pointer to an asset or class of some kind. And then in Blueprint, it's, or in the INI, it's a little easier to set that as a default across all the instances of that type. Neat. And then it can then be modified later. Yeah, but so I was going to say, yeah, by doing that in the in, a, in the INA, you can you can modify that later, and as long as none of the children have have modified it, they would still get that updated default. That's cool. I mean, they would get the updated default, but if you had man, if you had changed it to some other value, it wouldn't overwrite it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, uh, yeah something else I've been wondering as well is like sometimes you have I want to give them a default, but I'm living in C plus plus land, and I could give them a default, but if yeah, if they want to change it later, that they're not gonna they're gonna have to poke me or I'm gonna have to like go in and like change the the thing in C plus plus and that's gunky. That's a cool way of, of using that. Oh yeah, we've done that. Yeah, we have done that too where even for non complicated types like integers and stuff, some of the it it's a way that you can put weird you can expose default values to those properties for content developers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if anyone's done any like larger amounts of stuff on that. I guess it's like you. I think you can do like specific instances, right? Like not just like, hey, this, here's the class defaults. Like, can you do? Um... Yeah, you can do instances. Okay. I don't remember the. I don't remember the exact uh, like format for those, but I'm pretty sure there is a way to do that. I just I have this I have this like weird pipe dream in my head of like yeah we've got a, a game with like ten thousand items and it's all in any files and it's just like it looks like something straight out of like nineteen ninety five or something like I, <laughs> I don't know why this is like interesting because it sounds like a nightmare <laughs> it does yeah I know it sounds like probably like just not worth the uh, the the being able to say I did it <laughs> this is probably an absolute nightmare yeah um okay so we've had yaml i i don't know why tomal i put on there i just found it like, oh, one like, thing um... before we move on oh, from yeah. here that i want to mention also is that um any files are quite extendable in that they have this kind of hierarchy they can set up for your even your custom mini files so that you can have like a, a base file and then a default file for the project and then you can have platform specific where you override some things you know per platform and then you can have also like a, a user one uh and yeah, I haven't seen much people, uh, studios taking advantage of that. And also, the thing about it is that you can mark a property as to be config. And you can also mark it to automatically uh, forward it to become a CVAR. So that you can load it from a any, and then you can like change it on runtime through CVAR. Wait, CVAR is, I mean, that I... That's the thing you can poke through the console, right? Like, I mean, I'm yeah, not a yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's a console variable. So okay. you open the console, you do, you know, right now you can do, you know, R dot to change rendering stuff, and it's like the C bars are basically what you use to 
customize the engine per platform, as in like what graphical features, etc., that you want to use. Uh, but you, you can, in theory, use it for anything, any variable that you wouldn't change on runtime, and it supports both strings and integers and uh, floats. I guess like if you're having sort of debug interface stuff, that would be nice if you know that. You're like, okay, well, I know this thing, this thing exists in config, rather than like closing the editor, changing the config and reopening it, I can mess with it through CVAR right. rather than... I'm used to having to make like all my own debug tooling, like through MGUI or through something else, like, but that's... That's pretty useful to know. Like, maybe it's not something that yeah is suitable for big, large amounts of data, but if it's something yeah, sort and of... the, the the config file uh, class also allows you to save out any changes back to the config files, so it is quite powerful. Oh, wait, how do you do that? Like, that's like the thing. I mean, the, <laughs> the editor already do, does it when you change the project settings. It's literally just reading config files and then saving them back in. Oh yeah, okay. And these are not like these are basic functions they're not editor only uh-huh wait you could do it like for an actual game okay this, like this, is, how we, this is how we handle user settings for example when they change oh, the resolution yeah. and save it we're saving it into the user settings for any file uh, but I, I those are being say. saved into a different set of any files aren't they they're being saved into those the ones in like in the yeah, user in the documents folder. and not in the yeah part of the hierarchy of Stuff. Yeah, but that's when it's happening, for example, on runtime. But like, like I said, uh, that is going, th like you are specifically calling it as like save mm -hmm. you as user. Like I, I, because we also have functionality to save, for example, into the project settings or even engine settings, because that's what we're doing in, in the, you know, project settings dialogues in the editor. So yeah, you can just see what functions is calling and take advantage of it. My weird pipe dream of doing everything in, in any is becoming a reality. Like, <laughs> no. I would I would know that at least by default the innies are not encrypted at all when they're packaged. Like they're fully editable, which you know can be oh, nice in some situations. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, because they're not encrypted, um, it's security risk in in some situations depending on how they're yeah. used. If you're releasing on PC, it's like really easy to modify them. Versus, for example, if you're putting them in blueprints then it's you know a bit harder or like a lot harder mm -hmm. to get them of course but like if anyone wants to change any of these variables and they're you know good at good at you know programming in general they'll they'll get it done eventually mm. they'll they'll probably even enjoy the challenge like that that was our like main like in a previous project the the you know why we use ini was mainly because it's human readable and it's easy to well, you know, for for PC power users, they're they're kind of used to the format, so it's kind of nice to have like a like if you if you use that as your user settings, it's nice for them to just have it and and kind of edit it by hand. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, for security reasons, you also don't want to put every thing in the ini files because you know it's easy to put stuff in the ini files that's just gonna crash the game. So at the end of the day, it's still like. Uh, you kind of still have to do some validation and stuff since it's a, it's an external format. Uh, like uh, as soon as you're using any, you kind of have to assume the users can and will poke into it and 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 change stuff in it, mm -hmm. um, which is not the case for like more secure format, um, you know, like bit binary encrypted and stuff. But uh, yeah, I, w I was gonna say like in GUI save stuff in in any like when you. Like oh, yeah. if you're using Imgui in, in in Unreal, it say it already saves your your window positions into the into an ini file, and um, and and I I think like for if you actually have like if you if you make debug tools like in-game debug tools, it's kind of neat to to save those as as a in in a ini format too. Mm. Uh, it also makes them pretty easy to kind of locate on the computer because when you have an issue, uh, just say it, all the ini files in this folder is kind of is easy, you know, is easy. Yeah, something we've had issues with before when we're like, okay, I want to know like what's their setup to debug some, I don't know, some graphics issue and then they can send me their like, you know, game user settings in e file. So yeah, it's nice to use that to try and repro like what, what kind of settings they've got, what kind of like stuff they have that they've customized that could be causing their stuff to be broken. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for me, the, the limitation comes from the, the lack of... Uh... Because um, at the end of the day, the, the question between CSV, JSON, and stuff is kind of: Do you need like hierarchical representation, or or just a flat 
something more flat. Mm -hmm. um, and and I kind of that's why I tend to like well I don't love JSON because there's a bunch of issues like I, I don't consider JSON a human readable format. <laughs> and there are there are better stuff out there, but like since it's the standard, it's pretty easy to find implementations. Um, but I, I tend to like JSON these days. Uh, I used a lot of X, XML too in the past. Although, like usually XML, I kind of kind of use that as a pre pre cooked, you know, textual format because XML tends to be, you know, not easy, but like it's mergeable when you when you when you have diffs and and you're like you kind of deal with multiple pers people like modifying it. Unifies. I, I had I had like a bunch of issues. I don't know if it's Unreal specific, but like merging, I, I often have conflict with unifiers, so I, I don't know on that front mm -hmm. uh, if it's the diff tool getting confused easily or not. Um, I had less, I often have less like merging issues with XML, for example. Um, yeah, I've seen that too. At least it's the access over both. Like at least you, you kind of like you can't accidentally mess stuff up. <laughs> XML. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about in text formats before we get onto? Scripting languages. I don't know how much we're gonna go in depth, but um, yeah, this is, yeah, this is just like the idea of like, what if you used a scripting language for config? Like, it's kind of maybe a bit wacky, but I, I don't know. I was getting into Lua, and I was like, what? I want to use it for everything. Like, it, instead of like having to to you know specify a bunch of stuff in 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 JSON or in like CSV, what if you just had like a, a config? Uh, object in Lua, and you set all the properties, and it's very, very scripty. If you're, it depends. On, I mean, all these things depend on what your game designers and what those people are like into. Like, if they're if they're super into like scripting and stuff, I mean, it's, it's got, I guess it's kind of a bit like doing stuff through blueprints, but obviously it wouldn't work for ten thousand items. Like, if you had ten thousand items, all of them are like individual lines in like or individual function calls inside Lua, it's kind of a nightmare. Oh, I was just kind of curious if anybody had done anything like that. I, I've I've done a lot. <laughs> I've, I've worked a lot in Lua. Um, so yeah, for so on Call of Duty, you know, uh, the all the UI is is, is rendered like is kind of stored in in Lua, hmm. um, which is kind of neat and and allows us to like you know it 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 allows to patch easily stuff to patch stuff easily. Uh, since it's a textual format, it's also you know easy to to kind of edit for programmers and. The other advantage of Lua is it's kind of it's easy to export, like to generate Lua. You know, if you have a tool that kind of generates Lua, it's kind of easy to 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 do that. Oh, um, I know that. That's interesting. The 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 main issue. Well, there's a few issues with Lua. So the first one is that it's an untyped language, uh, and uh, you know it's a garbage collected language. So you can fall. You can quickly have uh, garbage collection issues. Kind of the same as you know you, you could get in in, in Unreal, but since the whole scripting language is is garbage collected, you don't you generate a lot of garbage all the time. So you have to be you know you you have to kind of know what you're doing so you don't have like performance issues. Although to be fair, like Lua Git is pretty good on that front, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and you know since it's untyped, uh, you can uh, you can fall into all the the issue you have with untyped languages, which is. Uh, uh, you know, it, it gets confusing. You, you don't really know what you're dealing with at uh, at all time. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of duct typing, which you know it's good for scripting, but um, it gets hard to to kind of have a structure, a good structure that's maintainable. Um, and and I think the other kind of you know you can deal with it, but it's it's it can be an issue that Lua is not multi-threaded. It is not you you cannot multi-thread the Lua VM. Uh, the language can I assume you only have your you know you always interact with the VM in a single thread, so uh, it, it can get uh, it can it can become a, bot a bottleneck pretty pretty fast if you're not careful. And as, and you know on that front for config files and and, and file loading and stuff, since you cannot multi-thread a, a VM, you can end up uh, having to to load all your files serially, uh, which is you know, if you if you have like if you deal with a lot of files, it can get slow pretty. F it, it can get slow, um, mm -hmm. and you don't you don't have a lot of ways to 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 get that faster because it's not you cannot multi-thread, like you cannot load two Lua files at the, at the same time, for example, which you can for which you can in JSON uh, and other language like that. Mm -hmm. 
I can see how that could be a problem. Yeah. Like if you're trying to, I mean, with the, even with like UI stuff, like the UI can get pretty big. But like, yeah, if you were trying to just like batch load a bunch of like descriptions for, I don't know, enemies or weapons or whatever, like yeah, you're just gonna, it it yeah, it's just gonna like take forever if you have to do the one by one by one. Yeah. Yeah. And and on the but you know on the other hand the, the fact that it's actually a scripting language for config files makes it nice or kind of neat because you can do math you can you can uh, you know you can generate your your you can have a, a data table and then have a, a bit of Lua code that kind of that is gonna go through your your data table and and modify entries or make sure you know do some validation in the script itself so uh, you get all the advantages of having your your config like your you know your scripting language in the same Lang as your scripting language. Yeah, I was which, kind of imagining uh, that. Like, if you have some, yeah. it, I mean, these will depend on like what what kind of designer do you have? What do they want? Like, we have there's some designer that's like, no, I want to be able to like run my own helper functions and like, okay, I have this raw data, but I want to set things up in a slightly different way. And like, in in uh, I don't know, in in a test thing, I want to be able to like spawn a bunch of dummy enemies. It's like, yeah, you can you can do that. Like, I mean, I guess you could do that in blueprints too. But like, yeah, if you if that's what they prefer, that's one way of doing it. Yeah, and it gets you know it can be it can it can be pretty. It's not like as unperformant as some as you could read online. Uh, like it's usable. Mm -hmm. uh, it scales pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, the the you you get you get you get the the kind of issues you would expect from a scripting language. Um, I I know I know like some people work on plugins to to for example have the the unreal ui goes through typescript mm. uh, or javascript tax which i think could be interesting too yeah i haven't really mentioned uh javascript in this but yeah that's something that some other studios have done like uh yeah like they just go through javascript for like everything um instead of lua or anything so i i guess i should have mentioned that more i guess i'm not really as familiar with that like i know the what's that there's that korean studio ncsoft like they they have their own like JavaScript implementation that they've they've like their own JavaScript like plugin for Unreal. So I guess they they do a ton of their stuff through like config and their data and stuff through through JavaScript. Um, one thing I was going to mention, like, let's see if I can open it up. I forgot to mention it at the time, but like, so we're looking at random like data tables, not data stuff. We're just sort of looking at data stuff for a new project, um, and. The, one of the engineers here found there's like a way of like doing hierarchical I guess it's kind of obvious like doing hierarchical data through um, JSON oh, okay no, I can talk about it another time it's not that super useful like for this we were kind of already talked that, that that JSON can do this stuff um, yeah I don't know I guess we kind of covered everything kind of run out of steam as well we can go for like an hour and a half which is pretty awesome <laughs> talking about all these cool things so suddenly oh, learned uh, fun Fun extra fact about the ini files is that um, I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually use it, but there is a specific format that you can do that an ini, ini file can import another ini file, but only one. So it's basically <laughs> meant to extend from a base ini file, but not using the hierarchy. It's like more like an import. What? But you can only import one. You can't import yeah. multiple. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> So it's more supposed to be like like extending, you know, like a base class, basically. Okay. And you import an any file that imports an any file. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. But only one. This is like a very, very like deep, but okay. okay. Yeah, it's called uh, based on, I think. <laughs> based on. Okay. Andrew, you're still with us. It's like, what, like 3.30 there? Like, this is... Yeah. <laughs> yep, 3.30 a.m. <laughs> Okay. Any based on. Okay. I'm assuming that you know Ben and Ari are going to start like any any game studios after this uh, <laughs> talk. Yeah, that's it. It's going to be any's all the way down. Yep. <laughs> uh, we were talking about scripting languages, and I saw that we have you know official epic representation. So we would be you know remiss not to say, do you have anything you want to share about verse? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well. Uh... Well, I'm, I can't tell you anything that, you know, I'm not supposed to say, but I can tell you what we already made public, and that is that Tim Sweeney already said publicly that uh, the Fortnite Unreal Engine editor is coming out later this year. And we have talked about that specific editor having verse inside of it. 
I don't know when it will come for other like Unreal Engine users, you know, mm. uh, when we put it into the engine itself. But usually anything that comes into Fortnite will eventually make it into the Unreal Engine editor. Neat. Wow. That sounds cool. I'm like, yeah, we get to see more of this. I've been, I'm always, yeah, super curious about that. Like, well, it's yeah, it's its primary purpose is exactly to be able to allow, you know, users to, well, it, like, we we already can allow people to make custom game logic in blueprints, but then you'd have to like load that into your game. So this is kind of like, yeah, it's like you know, scripting, but it's meant to allow people to uh, interact with your game through, you know, user generated content. And yeah. then you can, of course, also use it yourself for logic. That's super neat. Yeah, I've always been curious about like modding and stuff. I'm like, oh, if they want to add a mod and they have to have a blueprint, then they have to like get Unreal Editor and all this stuff. And it's like, no, just yeah, let them, and then let they them have to sign the AOL and stuff. stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, just let them open up a text editor and go nuts. This is great. Yeah. Um, okay, is anything else like people want to like mention, like talk about like before we wrap things up? Um, this has been super helpful. I'm really, really, they're really glad that everyone's like contributed so much cool information. Like, I think anybody that's going to think about, okay, what kind of data formats do I want to use? Like, this is a, hopefully going to be another, an, uh, even more information to put on their plate and have more, even more things to consider. But like, I think it's, yeah. it's good. Well, that's, I guess, the big thing. I was the versioning side of things. I'm curious what people do mm. with working on like incremental patches or content updates, like ideally you don't branch for everything and just how you handle the binary updates and where you only want certain files that are working or like you're, you're, you're patching one existing f version of a weapon, but you prototype it another. Ideally you can do that all in just, you know, a main branch. But right now it seems like a lot of people are just, you know, you have your separate branches and just people fully dedicated to the branch and release management of that content. And obviously if, some of the data is like external then it's easier to handle that merging and updates if it's less logical base but you can't always have that yeah i think on the same note i would be super curious to hear uh if anyone has done any work around uh kind of feature flags or or that kind of a system for you know conditionally cooking content or including content in particular updates uh, i i've never really gotten into the dlc stuff that uh that Epic provides, and it seems kind of heavy-handed for, for the kind of stuff you're talking about, Daniel, but because um, that's more what I'm thinking of, is like, yeah, this thing is not ready for prime time, and so we should just like put it under like a development feature flag, and then we can flip that feature flag one in our main branch, but when we ship, we don't want it to be uh, going out. I believe yeah. that, that's what we wanted to do at Epic Games with uh, game feature plugins, so that we could, you know, for example, making features for Fortnite, we could just turn them on and off. So they'd be like completely separate plugins that are just like built or not built in. Certain... Yeah, so, so yeah, so we have this plugin that is called the game feature plugin, which allows you to create your own plugins, funnily enough. Uh, but the thing about these plugins is that instead of your game kind of depending on your on those plugins, it's the exact opposite. The plugins depend on your game. The plugins know about your game and they can call functions on it to hook into everything. And the game is completely feature agnostic. I think I've seen some parts of it. So it's like, I saw some UI things there where it's like trying to find like all the things that might need yeah. to render on the screen. And they, they tell you like, oh, I'd really like to render in the bottom right. And it's just like... It's, <laughs> yeah, it's data injection, yeah. content exactly. injection. I think yeah, I, so I just started using them this weekend for a feature and it... It does seem like uh, at least the there, since there are still full plugins, the base project can still reference like code defined in that plugin, but the the, the editor tooling that will not allow the like the asset referencing within the content structure of that plugin. Yeah, so um, they can like the most basic. Oh, by the way, it's used heavily in Lyra, so go check out Lyra. It's a great example for anything Unreal Five. Uh, so, like, what you can do is the most basic functionality that allows you to kind of data inject is by just adding a component to a certain type of an actor. That's, like, built in by default. But you can add whatever you want there. You can make it call a function or an interface and, you know, whatever, just go wild. So I guess then to, to your, go back to your point of your, like, content versioning between releases, you would 
I guess you'd have to be going towards this way of like making everything a wait game feature plugin. Is that, <laughs> you forget? I'm, I'm not sure how you would use it with like you know if you're going to use it for versioning, but uh, it is great for for example you know if we want to add a feature to. Uh, Fortnite, and we don't want it to leak out because it's already in the base game that we're shipping out. We can develop it as a, a game feature plugin that's completely separate and not shipped. And you know, until we're ready to enable it, we just enable it. It will cook it, and then in the next release, it's like out and as if it has been there the whole time. Oh, so in that case, it's actually cooked in already as part of it. It's not like removed during the. It's not like okay, so this is an editor only thing or a non a non shipping thing it's actually already there and then you just flip the switch to enable it well, well the thing is like you can uh you can load them enable them disable them and unload them both like in the editor and also at runtime so yeah you can decide whether a game feature plugin gets cooked or not and if it gets cooked you can still selectively load it or not and you can even load it in during gameplay and then load it out again okay so I this could... allows some really neat things Okay. Oh, so I'm curious. Like, if you're aware from Epic's perspective, do they expect people to do that for even like very small individual things, like a like a, an ability or a spell? You'd have that in its own plugin, where like you're you're working on the next version of this spell, but you don't want it to be in this release. But you have like, like I met. I mean, it's like with any data abstraction. Like, is it worth the abstraction itself? It's always a bit of a hassle. Um, I think we did it quite well in Lyra. Uh, we tried to take a practical approach where we put things that make sense in a game feature plugin, and then like most of the things are just straight into you know the game project itself. Yeah, I mean, even looking at Lyra, I'm just comparing to like potential structure for my project. I would expect Shooter Core to be like ten plugins. Just if yeah. if you're looking at it at a scale like the actual content scale of like a shipping project where you have yeah. like you know hundred x the amount of content than what's in Lyra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it it works like you can definitely if you, if you want to like for example the a jump ability you could make that a game feature plugin. Um, we had a, a video by uh, Christoph, one of our evangelists, about game feature plugins, and there he managed to even make the shop in the game, a game feature plugin. It had a UI, like you could interact with it, and it, it like added the UI for currency. So hmm. yeah, you can go quite wild with it. Okay, it seems like that would definitely work for like, if you're adding like a completely new feature, I mean, it is called a game feature plugin, right? Like you, that yeah, seems yeah. like it would work really well, like for the, for like content versioning of like, okay, I've got, I don't know, I've got the shop, but I want to like add a bunch of new stuff within their extended ex existing or like modify values. Like I think that that's like the classic example of like, oh yeah, I'll do that in a branch. Um, I don't know if that would work as well in this situation, yeah. right? I, I think... Yeah, I think uh, some of the use cases I can see is like, for example, if you have limited time events in live service games, uh, where you don't want to like touch the base content of your game, so you can just make it as a game feature plugin, enable it at the beginning of the event, and then just disable it at the end, and then you're not really taking anything out of your base core project. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, that's like a perfect example of uh, good yeah. user fit. I'm, I've been I've been really digging into game features plugin. Like I created the capture the flag mode for it as well. It's 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 quite extensible. Like. Um, you can add primary asset types to scan. You can add like basically anything, um, components, uh, widgets, and everything else. Like even input configuration as well. You can even tell the game feature plugin to add like a new key binding uh, to the project as well. Wait, are yeah. you the one who added capture the flag to Lyra yeah, on yeah, Twitter? Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's I retweeted me. you. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking at oh. that. It seems really awesome. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm definitely planning on using, you know, feature plugins for everything you guys are talking about. I think, to, but per like the within a feature versioning stuff, that's where it gets more complicated. Yeah. One thing that Valorant is exploring right now is they do have a pretty significant engine change to actually have like a concept of like content layers where within a single branch, it will save out copies of a, an associated U object that then the references to that have drop downs to pick which one is relevant during a given time. And then there's cook steps to do all that. But it's a very intrusive engine change that they're experimenting with right now. And I don't think Epic has any plans to do anything along those lines. We've been talking to them about it. So I was just curious as well. Um, one other thing we've also been talking about for longer term is like even an even more intrusive engine change where we do property level versioning 
where we'd actually have separate CDOs or potentially just to have uh, different versions of content itself at the U-object level to wow. uh, so work with it if, within the the branching scheme and it's like particularly like this is very like far future but like Riot's working on MMO and it's the MMO tech league just thinking about that kind of data update model and how you do live updates hot fixing etc with still making it very comfortable for designers to work inside the unreal ecosystem to not have to work on and use external content or an external editor wow so you're talking about just to like make more like a random con- con- uh, concrete example you'd be like okay this is the the fireball spell 1.1 1. 1, and it has like you, yeah. you choose like am i am i like editing 1.1 1. 1 or 1. 1.0 am i creating a new 1.2 and I go and change all the values for like damage or speed or whatever. That's the kind of thing you're talking about. Yeah, it's in tech design territory right now, but we've we been we've been thinking about this because yeah, live service world. You want to <laughs> yeah. you know, the speed of which you want to update content is pivotal. It's the same for us. Like um, title I'm working on right now is persistent online world. Um, and the one of the issues that we have too is like thinking about cross-platform updates like we have cross we're gonna have we're thinking we're probably gonna have cross play um so you need to coordinate updates and you need to coordinate content that is activated by clients so that it matches um that might be a thing where game future plugins are like yeah this is the v11 game future plugin and you have cooked it and it's available but you don't use it until every platform has gotten the update so that we can enable it with like some kind of feature flag everywhere or something like that. Um, I don't really know how we're going to handle it, but we're we're trying to think about it. There, yeah. there is another feature of Game Future plugin is that it can be. I'm not hundred percent this, but I think it can be downloaded at runtime as well. So, for example, you can, um, for example, put your a data asset that overrides some value as a Game Future plugin, and then have your game download that at runtime, and then just like replace that data asset. And then just exchange the values from there. Um, I've seen some like functions and uh, logics for downloading game feature plugin, but I haven't like explored it fully. It's interesting the idea of like overriding stuff. Like if it's yeah, if it's because oh, I've I've heard of things like oh, this game feature thing can like add something, but like whether it like replaces or or kind of like hides existing behavior. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because like to Daniel's specific example, like. You know, when he was saying that they can override, you know, they can pick which version of an asset they're using. Like, that sounds very appealing just because of the. Like, as an example, what I'm thinking of is like, we will have an activity, which is a client side concept that is, um, you know, something you engage with, like some, uh, maybe a, um, a, a, a dirt mound might be an activity. And you'll have, you know, a server side state representation of that, which is using, you know, custom state machines but then you'll have the activity which is client side and then you'll have maybe a piece of equipment like you might have a shovel um and so updating that activity will involve synchronizing a you know state server side thing which that's easier and then a client side you know activity as well as the equipment but you don't want to apply the changes to that equipment until you ship the update for the activity like those two things need to go together and so you're modifying a couple of assets and they both reference the new version of the content. And so you kind of want like those to be in their own bundle, you know, like they, they need to be aware of each other and not be visible to the older versions of the content. This is still the yeah, interesting thing, like how do you yeah, tag content. I'm I'm so used to doing stuff in C plus plus where it's just like if defs or or like ifs everywhere. Like trying to go yeah, yeah from there to diff- like data is still yeah, kind of frying my noodle. <laughs> it's very not scalable, like the traditional model, the box product model. When you're looking at live content, in particular worldwide content and multi platform content, we can have per region, per platform like different patching, different server variants, different client variants, and how you keep all that in sync and how you deploy everything gets very messy. Well, when you solve it, please come back and tell us. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's other games are right up that have been doing it for a while. That's why part of why they're successful. But I'm just still thinking about it for mine since I'm pretty new to the company, just learning what they've been doing. I remember needing to do some A-B, A-B testing stuff and yeah. 
even there like you know the, the whole issue of uh, keeping assets around uh and related to you know versioning um because you kind of you kind of don't want to you kind of don't want your user to download assets you they might not want you know they might not use and when you enter like the the live game realm you kind of always push new content and also I, I remember an issue where you, you, we had like two you know you, you get two versions of the same map like the winter version and the and the and the summer version and you kind of have to like split those up in some ways and at the same time when you do content generation for your artists uh, they, they kind of need to be able to to see both version like the whole pipeline kind of gets impacted by that uh, so if, if you yep. don't have the, the base tool it gets hairy very fast and um, basically by my initial question like at a, at the lower level I, I was wondering what unreal kind of did to help you uh, you know do the very baseline versioning of so, like I, I guess the main example I have is like if you have a setting struct uh, and and you have like some properties in there that um, gets invalid because at some point you know the the code change and interpret the properties in some other way. Do you have currently a way in Unreal to kind of say a hey, this struct has been loaded from a version three three struct and we kind of need to patch it, uh, you know, to version four? And you know, do you have a way to kind of intercept the deserialization process to to do that at some point, because I know like some solutions would be to kind of keep the you know keep the old the the old version of the struct in your code base and kind of have a patch you know to go from one version to the other. I don't know if Unreal kind of has something in there to do. Not that I know of. Like all we've done for our stuff is like, yeah, you you have a version number like in the structure, and you try and update the thing to the latest version, and then the rest of the game just always assumes you have the latest version. So like during your deserialization, you try and like, yeah, make the intelligent ish guess of like, okay, it's coming in as version three. We're on version five. Upgrade it to three to four, and then four to five, and. Yeah, I don't know. It's just classic like version deserialization issues. Like, I don't think Unreal has anything built in for that. It's just we well, our version Unreal is has basically doing it in post load. That's how we do it. Yeah, and the Unreal does have the concept of custom versions, which is the you can associate um, version numbers with specific asset types. You, I think like my go to reference is the Paper Two D plugin has some asset. Uh, hello, sir. Some asset versioning. <laughs> Uh, you can do for for that where you can detect which version it was on before and um at load time like even in the serialization methods you can you can use those to influence the decision making okay it's in place load and then check out paper 2 i'm taking notes of this <laughs> okay but yeah we do a lot of versioning like per assets, like per types. And uh, yeah, you can see it in Unreal Engine already. Um, it's, I think they always do it in post load. That means that if you like open the asset to work on it, it will automatically get updated. And also if you're loading it like in a client and it hasn't been up, uh, updated in the editor, it will still like, you know, update itself. But you always have to provide a forward upgrade path in the code yeah, in post load. And uh, custom Asset versions are a great way of like keeping track of, oh, so we're now on this version and we're upgrading to this. Then we have to do this upgrade step and then this upgrade step. And now we say, now it's at the newest version, so we don't have to do, do that upgrade path again. That that sounds that sounds what I, I, I need. Like, I, I'll have to check it out. And because I, I think, yeah, talking about the forward, you know, forward versioning, like one big issue was backward versioning because you could have, I think on, on PS4, have a, you know, someone boot the game at a later version, then kind of uninstall it and install the first version, and then you kind of have to end all that 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 file that like is some version forward. But I guess I guess at that point you're better off just resetting everything. Yeah, I I do remember us having some functionality where like if a property doesn't exist, it will just ignore it. But, um, oh, but it, I think it's like stays in the file. Like yeah, well, like I, I'm not sure actually how it works with the. Yeah, I don't know enough about it to claim anything. So, <laughs> it's okay. 
when you when you say custom asset version, is that like it, is that a property that exists? So you mean you have to make your own like integer on each of your structs? Like, it's... yeah, you make your own like basically it's an enumerable they can make uh, for like each asset class, and then starts with zero and then goes upwards. And then you can check that custom asset version. Okay. You, you, uh, I think you give your custom asset version a GUID, a unique GUID, and then you oh, that's right. associate that GUID with the type, like with the type of the asset that's being serialized. And so you don't, in the sense that like, yes, it's associated with your class, but you don't have like an integer in your class. It is a part of the, um, I think it's part of the like Unreal header serialization. Like if you look at US at RS, like you have custom versions are like part of the metadata in the US at um, that is loaded for every asset before any of your custom serialization happens. I think the the power of it, like the the thing you can't do with like an integer in your class, is if you want to change the serialization format. Um, so I think that's why it's kind of valuable because it's big. It's big for the editor, right? Like between version four twenty seven and five of Unreal Editor, you know, you want to change some of the texture, like how textures are serialized or whatever. Um, and the custom versions are applied, you know, at a time where you can actually intercept it in the serialized function and have different uh, on-disk representations that you're loading and saving, uh, as opposed to just properties. Because, like, the common thing that I do when I don't have kind of very aggressive needs for, for versioning is maybe, like, an integer field or just, like, you know, add a new field and then in your post load, you know, migrate data from an old field into it, use the like underscore deprecated naming for variables to make them load but not save, uh, and then handle them in post load. Um, that's usually yeah. like 90% of the time that's fine, uh, but for more complex cases, you can use custom versions. Yeah, you can search the code base for get linker custom version and see how we're already using it. Thank you. This is, yeah, this is amazing useful information I would, yeah, it's always things that, that exists. It's just a case of finding it. Like, <laughs> thank you. Um, does anyone have anything else? I think we're going to, I said we're going to have a two hour-ish hard limit on this. So we've got five minutes <laughs> to grab anything else people want to talk about. It's been really interesting so far. Um, yeah, I guess I just want to say thank you to everybody for like contributing and, and uh, yeah, giving so much information. Thanks, yeah, Ari as well for like coming in, and telling us all about extra useful, useful stuff. Um, yeah, my pleasure. This was fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm gonna probably put this online on YouTube at some point. Um, I hope that's okay. Uh, and I'll try and update some of these these notes and I don't know somehow cobble this all together. <laughs> but yeah, the, yeah. Sorry, I have to apologize for. Uh being the sole reason you're going to have to tag this as explicit on YouTube. Uh, I will not take offense if you decide to cut out my swear in the beginning when I was talking about the text-based serialization. Oh, I didn't even... I, oh, okay. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't notice that, but yeah, sure. I'll try and get rid of any any bombs. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, they'll do this again another time. If people have any other ideas they want us to like, have roundtables or discussions and stuff about, just like drop them in the chat. But thanks everybody for your time. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Later. Nice. Thanks for hosting. Thanks, folks. It's over. Finally, I'll turn on my camera. Oh.